in this episode of the Critical Oxygen Podcast. Once the microchip is compromised, it, it's, it becomes a lot more of a reactionary process. Saying this in bold capital letters, don't let your first workout be a hard effort because you need to measure yourself. You need to have an easy workout and check your systems. How am I feeling? Does this hurt? How's the RP? Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Critical Oxygen Podcast, where we help you optimize your physiology and maximize your athletic potential. I'm your host, Phil Batterson, and today we're joined by continuing guest host, Coach Aaron Geyser, where we're going to talk about how to stay healthy during your training and during your season. Aaron, welcome back to the show. What's up? Fun topic today. No, I know it should be it should be fun. We're uh, for those of you on YouTube, you might you might see that the background is a little bit different. Um, had a little snafu in terms of locking myself out of my office before starting the recording. So uh, <laughs> um, people also that... see me with like headphones on too. So mm -hmm. yeah, and his uh, and Aaron's audio, you know, is, uh, we we got his audio and everything set up. So you know, he's got the headphones, he's got the the microphone, all of that. So. All in all, I just hope that everyone's having a good listening experience. That's the bottom line. <laughs> I, I'm I'm now a fake professional podcaster. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I and you know now I'm in the other in the other seat where I'm just using my my AirPods, and actually I have a you know a little lapel mic right here. So oh, I'm just hoping that it turns out well. So fingers crossed. <laughs> this could be a roller coaster for all of us. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, so, so Aaron, we were, we were kind of talking offline about, you know, like one of, I mean, I always say this on the podcast is in order to maximize your potential, you got to start with three things, consistency, specificity, and progression, but without consistency, you can't be specific. And without consistency, you can't progress your fitness. So one of the big things to staying consistent, and I think we've talked about it over the course of the last couple of episodes is, uh, you know, recovery, that's a big one and staying injury free. But another one of the big ones, and this is something I noticed, because I was just just flying back from the endurance exchange, so this is going to kind of date, date us a little bit in terms of, you know, when this actually gets uploaded. But there were so many people who are just like, you know, coughing up a lung, and snot just dripping and all this sort of stuff. And I was like sitting in the airport. And there was these two people right in front of me, who are just like every two seconds, just like, <laughs> and I'm just like, do I, do I put my mask on? Do I, you know, like, like bathe myself in alcohol and hand sanitizer? Like, what do I do here? Because it, it was one of those things where the, the, what I'm trying to say is getting sick is one of those blockers to consistency because, um, I've, I've met people who will get sick. They'll be sick for a week and then they'll come back. They'll exercise probably a little too hard. Then they'll get sick again for another week, and then all of a sudden they're out for two, three weeks, and it's super discouraging because then when you get back on the bike, when you get back out there for a run, when you get in the pool, you feel like all of your gains are just absolutely gone. They're not, and we'll talk about that, but yeah, being staying healthy, not sick, is probably one of the biggest things. Well, and another thing that you probably, you kind of touched on, but athletes will come back out of that state constantly and try to pick up what they think they lost mm -hmm. in a workout or two. And it just kind of starts the, the roller coaster ride again of sick, not sick, sick, not sick, sick, not sick. And if you continue to do that same thing, you're going to continue to have those same challenges and complications because you are teetering on health and not health, but then when you go out and do an intense session, all these other physiological things take place within your body that you, your body has to decide, one, do I send these resources to aid in recovery from the workout, or do I send these to aid in the battling of getting the infection out of our body? Mm -hmm. And either way, if we're even cutting that half and sending them both to both of those directions, we're fighting two battles on shorthanded uh, infantry. So 
you, you got to just go about it just a little bit smarter and a little bit easier. And as you said, you didn't really use lose that much fitness in the first place. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to go trying to search it in one or two days coming back. Yeah. No, I know. I think that is whenever something happens, uh, you know, with a lot of us, we miss a workout, we have something happen, you know, with life and and get stressed out or get injured or get sick. We're always trying to then play that catch up game when we get back. And I think that's, that's a really bad mentality to be in. And I think you said it on the podcast and it really resonated with me. It's just like, if you miss a workout, you miss a workout, just keep on doing what you were doing. Right. You know, it's a, it's that continuation. And again, this is, I, I think this podcast episode is just going to turn into all about how to stay consistent, you know, essentially mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because, because at the end of the day, right. You know, it, the, the, the big thing is that, you know, you're, you're trying to mitigate swings and stress and I think, okay, so let's, let's start with how to avoid getting sick to the best of our ability. And then we can kind of transition to, well, what happens if you do get sick? Is there like a protocol for X amount of days that you're sick, X amount of days getting back into it and other things like that. So let's just start with what, you know, like what sort of things do you do that help you avoid getting sick in the first place <laughs> other than Why other not? than don't go outside don't interact with people face to face and don't shake people's hands right you know those are <laughs> <laughs> which you just kind of put me in a box right there no <laughs> I, for myself it really is i i Let me start by saying this, Phil, when it comes to either myself or talking to my athletes, what I try to do myself for, for them and for myself, I look at where the weaknesses are and Mm. where complications and challenges come up. I, my wife and I don't have children. We have three dogs. That's where we've drawn the line. I don't have that being brought into the house on a day-to-day basis, but a Mm -hmm. lot of my athletes do. So we we assess that. Okay, so when kids are bringing things back into the household, we have to be more on on our game. These other things, if you are a business person that's going into meetings where people are being traveled, this is a weakness. A lot of these things, like like you jokingly said, but it is reality, I don't have that that openness or that experience but i'm analyzing and reviewing this for my athletes to know now here's where i at least need to address this with this athlete or at least make them like understanding that this is where the crack in the foundation can come from Mm -hmm. so here is what we need to do around that to try to prevent that from taking place so I, i for myself My wife only has to go into the office three days a week, if that. She is typically in her own office, can close the door, doesn't necessarily have to see people on a regular basis. Again, I work predominantly from home. I might go into the physical therapy office two times a week and see a total of like six people Mm -hmm. face to face. The other interaction that I'm getting, of course, is at the pool, but for the most part, I can kind of put these barriers up around me and my household to not bring that into the house and, and open it up. And it's kind of funny how you were talking about the uh, exchange this past week. And my, uh, we went to a hockey game on Saturday and it was a pretty packed event Mm -hmm. and you're just kind of walk. It's an old arena. So it's very jam packed when you're walking through the concourses getting to, you're just like, man, if I get through this, I, I'm a healthy individual. <laughs> yeah. You get to like Wednesday and you're like pumping your fist like, yes, I made it through. But really what I would advise the listeners to, to do is to analyze and assess their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And this doesn't stop with just them. you got to go into your areas of contact and exposure because that's often where it's also going to come from. So Mm -hmm. anytime that you have 
a kid going into school or you going into something where a lot of people have traveled or going into an airport and being around a lot of other people. These are just things where I really recommend, okay, maybe we back down your effort on the workouts. Mm. We focus on nutrition. We focus on sleep and we control the system from decreasing stress just in case there's Mm -hmm. stress in the background that we can't see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, well, I mean, in like conferences and like those sort of things where you're meeting a lot of people and everyone's excited about it. So then you stay up super late, you know, talking and then you don't get good sleep. Cause I think when I got to North Carolina, I ended up going, you know, essentially going to bed at midnight which that's not that big of a deal because I normally go to bed at nine o'clock my time, but midnight East Coast time. But then because I was in a new bed in a hotel, unfamiliar with other things like that, I like felt like I never fell asleep. And then we had to wake up at like seven the next morning, which is really 4 a.m. my time. You know, so that's going to, you know, cause a little bit of stress. And then on top of that, then you get to the venue and then you talk all day, every day with, you know, hundreds of people. And, you know, so, so knock on wood, I think I, I think I dodged it, but I was getting to oh, the point absolutely. where at this point, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, if I stay healthy out of this, like I was, I was even thinking, I was like, maybe it's the dogs, maybe having like the dogs who go outside, root around in like the mud and all that sort of stuff. And then I'm like cuddling with them. Like maybe that gives me a little bit of, you know, blocker or it could just be, I got completely lucky and didn't get sick, you know? <laughs> so. And that's, I, I, you might be onto something. It's one of those things where when, I, I can't remember being sick. Oh, dude, now you, now you jinxed it. Um. I've said this many a time. So I've, <laughs> I've played this game before and yeah. look, it's, I, I'm already dealing with the percentages are, are, you know, falling towards that way every day that I'm on this earth. So <laughs> right. at this point, if I'm going to play with that number, I might as well just go ahead and play with it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Might as well just kind of play fast and loose with it. But yeah, that was um, okay. So, so I like, I like those sort of things, you know, what are the weaknesses? What are the potential exposures that you could have? Another one that I want to bring up is um, big fluctuations in stress, like kind of like what you talked about is, when I've worked with, say, high school athletes or collegiate athletes, the biggest times that people get sick is either at the very beginning of the term where, you know, they're getting into their classes, you know, things are stressful, you're switching up your um, your lifestyle a little bit, or towards the end of the term when exams are happening and, you know, you're kind of winding down a little bit, but maybe you've been operating at a really high stress for a while. It's those fluctuations in, in life stress I find leave a lot of my athletes vulnerable to getting sick. And I don't know a great solution for that. Maybe it's, you know, how do we, how do we kind of make a more even keel in terms of, you know, like the stress and like minimizing, right. uh, Workload, like exercise workload towards the beginning and the end of the semester. Right. So you can transition into it. Well, I'm not going to say that this is a silver bullet, but this is where HRV I feel is, huge. Mm. And I, us at Endure IQ really put it into our prescription, but we also, with with Dan having his doctorate in that field, we've been able to gather a lot of information and pick his brain and also just recognize how to make adjustments off of that. But I still feel that HRV for training, whoop, these are going to at least give you even or ring. These are going to give you options, whether you're an athlete or not an athlete, it's going to measure your parasympathetic stimulation. Mm-hmm. And if that number is not to your normal baseline, then that's telling you something. Okay. I got a little bit of stress. And for those that doubt heart rate variability, I, I asked them to one, Get a 7 to 10 baseline, 7 to 10 Mm -hmm. day baseline, then track it for a good 21 to 45 days and see when they have stress. Just make a note of it. When they have a, a, a project or a deadline at work or the kids have been a little bit higher, uh, stress load, 
note that. And what you're going to see is these numbers are going to ebb and flow with some of those stresses that you have come up. And, mm -hmm. and I do feel, like I said, it's not a silver bullet. And I don't want anybody to walk away from this conversation thinking that it is. But it could at least provide you with a little bit of detail when that parasympathetic nervous system has not been stimulated enough. Mm -hmm. that you have a higher level of stress, you're getting that sympathetic stress level a little bit higher. And maybe it is just a good call to back off of something that you do have control over because you don't have control over your kids maybe causing a little bit more stress or you don't have uh, the ability to change that deadline that you have at work. But I do have this, I'm, I'm working out like a crazy person or I'm doing something else that I do have control over that is where you really need to tighten the screws and get a little bit more control. And mm -hmm. I do feel like that could provide you with a little bit more management and health in that sense by just paying attention to a number, whether, again, I repeat this, whether you're an athlete or not. And I really do think that HRV is a number that every single person should pay attention to on a day-to-day -day basis because it really can play into your benefit. If you get to understand it, you pay attention to the numbers and you recognize what your life stress is. And when you combine that information, hey, you know what? I got a lot of stuff on my shoulders. Maybe I should make a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And I think too, it's it's not you know, one deviation, right? Because, you know, for example, we went out to dinner with, you know, some friends last night. I had a uh, a glass of, you know, hard cider or something like that. And then ate quite a bit, you know, during the dinner. And I always find that my HRV is lower during the, that night's sleep, just because I'm digesting, I'm probably dealing with the alcohol, other things like that. But again, that's higher. So that results in lower HRV, which indicates higher sympathetic stress, which if you're in a constant state of higher sympathetic stress, then that's where you're opening yourself up to uh, suppressed immune response, or you know, then getting sick uh, in the in the back end of it. But one, you know, that's and that's why we take the average, right? The rolling average mm -hmm. over five, ten days, because you're trying to figure out, oh, is this just a, you know, a, a blip because I, you know, went out and had a little bit too much fun last night, or is this a, tr it was this a trend that it was actually going down, you know, for an extended period of time opening myself up to, you know, potentially getting sick and then actually getting sick. And you, you will find, or uh, I, I had a buddy of mine who got really, really sick and he always uses, he uses whoop and his like HRV went from like a hundred to like 20 or something like that. And it was like, it was, it was really quite fast. And I don't remember leading up to it. If it was like, you know, a hundred, 50, 50, 50, and then 20. Right. But like, during the sickness, once you get sick, you know, you'll, you'll really notice your HRV plummet because your body is in a constant state of stress and challenge, you know, trying to actually heal and repair itself from that. And the other positive about taking your heart rate variability on a regular basis is when you do get sick, like in your friend's scenario, I could track that. And then when we start to see an uptick and turn and then a level off, that is when we know, okay, now we can start to add some normal training procedure to the process where if we just start to see the tick up, that's what we want to see. That's also the body recovering and repairing itself from that particular uh, illness. But if it's still trending upwards, it still does not mean that we have met our baseline and are normal at that point. Mm -hmm. So that would not, we could start to maybe do some low, low, low intensity exercise at that stage, but we want to see kind of that back to normal baseline stay or stability or stable at that point. Then we can start to trickle in the normal workload that we had had before the sickness. And then we're going to have less likely of that roller coaster of being sick, not sick, being sick, not sick. So this is another really, really key thing of why I think heart rate variability is key around sickness, because it's going to provide you with some of those details that we always have really kind of guessed about. And mm -hmm. it's going to 
again, it's not a perfect scenario, but it's going to give you more reliable information to make quality decisions on to open yourself to less likely open yourself up and being susceptible to get re-sick and Mm -hmm. again and again. Yeah. And I think too, so that's kind of getting into, you know, it's like, okay, well now you got sick. So is there anything else like in terms of, you know, like, you know, risk and stress management? I think that's a big one. Um, Sleep obviously goes in there as well. Like if you, if you have interrupted sleep or if, you know, something is happening where you're depressed sleep, other things like that, then that's probably one of those scenarios where you're going to want to reduce your stress load, you know, by it, by the things you can control. And then um, I, I think, oh, oh, I think another big thing that we need to touch on is just is nutrition and eating in a either calorie surplus or a calorie maintenance, because like, you know, and there's, there's studies out there that are like, oh, if you're not eating, eating enough carbohydrates, you know, you, you, depress your immune system and stuff. But I really do think it comes down to, are you eating in calorie maintenance or are you in a constant deficit? If you're in a constant deficit, then you're always going to be playing that catch up game where your body is trying to rebuild with, uh, things that are not, um, available with, you know, nutrients that are not available. So it's just going to be more and more stress. So yeah, I really think nutrition is a huge thing that, that we need to, uh, pay attention to in order to try to mitigate stress and mitigate our risk for getting sick. 100%. And I'm not somebody that believes into that carbohydrate thought. And I do think it's more of total calories in that case. Mm -hmm. And if we tracked it, you would recognize that you're just most likely not getting calories. And what I tend to recommend, I mean, fat's more dense anyway. So if you are slightly behind later in the day, Throw a little bit of either olive oil, butter, what, whatever your diet allows for, but get something that is very, very robust in fat calories. Mm-hmm. It's very dense and it's going to make a lot, a huge difference very quickly on how much calorie. I mean, a tablespoon of olive oil on some vegetables is going to give you another 120 to 140 calories. Right. Just like that. And right. if you're behind, sometimes you're you're gonna have to eat almost two point what two point two more uh, grams of carbohydrates to mm-hmm. get to the grams of fat per one gram. Right. No, that's actually that is such a good point because I think people who struggle to maintain um, caloric maintenance that is a perfect example of like you know. Eat a, eat a tablespoon or two tablespoons of peanut butter, right? If Like, cause I, I love peanut butter. Like that's like the sort of thing I can just like, you know, get, crack into a, a jar and just like have a spoonful of it, right? It makes your, makes your mouth a little bit, you know, a little bit sticky, but at the same time, it tastes pretty damn good. And, you know, I, I think in just in nutrition and wellness in general, we vilified fats for way too long. And, you know, it, it's, it's just being aware of, you know, what you're actually eating but it always starts at are you eating enough do you have enough calories and then you can start to play with like we've talked about this before you can start to play with your macro balance and other things like that with i think the least amount of wiggle room you have is with protein but then you know depending on how you're responding to things fats and carbohydrates right should be you know kind of intermixed um and the that that is such a good point if you're somebody who chronically under eats adding more fats like butter, olive oil, you know, peanut butter, um, coconut oil, oil, nuts are really good because they're really, you know, calorically dense. Those are really, yes, avocado, really, really good ways of uh, supplementing those calories and getting higher without having to like, you know, for example, if you were trying to eat the same amount of calories, like you'd have to eat two or three bagels versus, you know, a, a table or a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter or something like that. Right. Um, and not everybody can handle a couple of bagels. So it, right. it, also, again, at that point, it, you get into what is being broken down and what is being absorbed. And sometimes just getting that more calorically dense nutrient into your body is going to be absorbed a little bit easier and quicker in that form than taking in two, two and a half bagels in that case. And that's Mm -hmm. just, 
it gets a little aggressive at that point. Yeah, no, it, 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 exactly. So, um, yeah, so we've touched, now we've touched on nutrition, which is just eating enough, uh, mitigating stress, getting enough sleep, <clears throat> trying to, trying to mitigate fluctuations in stress. But, you know, say you're doing all this sort of stuff and you still get sick because, you know, like, let's be honest, right. You know, you have, you have a kid that comes in, they got it from, you know, another kid and then they have, you know, and then you get sick just, just because of that. What's the, what's the next step is like, okay, well, you know, do you have general rules about, oh, well, if it's, you know, from like the, the, the neck up or the neck down, you can exercise or not, you know, what's, I, I err always on the side of caution. So as soon as I get sick, I'm like, nope, my body's going to be stressed, especially, you know, if you're following that HRV trend. Um, I'm just like, I'd rather rest, get over it faster than, you know, try to force myself to do a workout that might potentially make it worse. Mm -hmm. Once the microchip is compromised, it, it's, it becomes a lot more of a reactionary process. And as you said, typically I react in the same way. Uh, conservative aspect where, you know what, I'd much rather remove the stress, let the body focus and deal with what it needs to deal with, and then get you back into exercise maybe two days down the road rather than it turning into a week. Mm -hmm. So that you're, you're more typically our body reacts opposite when in a sick or compromised state from exercise than any other time. Mm -hmm. So where we typically are growing when we provide the stimulus of exercise and fitness, when our body is compromised, it has the negative effect. It takes mm -hmm. you in the opposite direction. So with that thought process, you're, you're probably going to be better off if you do nothing. If you decide to do something, really, let's just take it from a circulatory and easy cardiac aspect where maybe we just want to improve our oxygenation throughout the course of our body. So let's go completely zone one, no effort. I barely want you to feel like you're doing anything. And it'd be kind of the equivalency of walking mm -hmm. on the bike. It would just be spinning your legs. That's where I would kind of draw the line. It, absolutely in no way. If we have that critical workout today, that critical workout takes a back seat to your health because your health is more critical than that workout. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that is a, that is a good way to approach it. And I, I'm speaking from experience here because I've had days where it's like, you know, I'm starting to kind of get sick and I'm like, oh, I can go muscle my way through this. And then sure, sure as shit, every single time it's like the next day, I just feel absolutely awful. And, you know, then it's an extended, uh, you know, sickness versus, and, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. you never know really what would have happened if I would have said, oh, I'm just going to take the day off. But I think that, you know, by not digging myself more of a hole, I'm going to, wind up being able to recover from the stress of sickness better than, you know, adding on to that and having it potentially hit a tipping point by exercising. And I want to remind everybody, exercise is a stress, right? You know, if, if you, if you took two different things or, you know, if you took two different descriptions of the physiology of exercise and like the physiology of uh, like something similar to like a, a heart attack or something like that, and just read out, Oh, Heart rate is 180. Blood pressure is three, you know, 300 over, you know, 120. Like uh, hormones are being released that are stress hormones, like all this sort of stuff. It would almost match exactly what's happening during, you know, like sickness or other sort of stresses. So it just remember that exercise is a stress, and if you're already stressed enough by being sick, then you're just going to accelerate, you know, your, your deterioration by, by exercising. Cause you're just adding more stress on top of that. So your, your stress bucket is overflowing. And that within itself 
is the recommendations that I think we can echo the loudest is, yes, when we're in situations as human beings, sometimes we don't make the best decisions. If you find yourself with check, and that's why I kind of told, I started out by saying all of these weaknesses, if we start to look and analyze, have I been exposed to these weaknesses? Am I potentially getting sick? You have to step back, remove yourself from the scenario start checking those boxes. And if more boxes are checked than not of those stresses, of those areas of weakness that have been infiltrated, it's probably a smarter decision to just say, you know what? I'm going to miss today with the hopes of it's a missing today. Mm -hmm. Where if I go and throw myself against the wall, I might shatter and then I'm missing four, five, six days. So it's removing yourself, stepping back, asking the question, is this smart? And then moving away from, and again, you're going to be better off if you have a list of things that you've either been exposed to or that have not been up to the level that you have from the expectation from a day to day. Mm -hmm. These are going to make you have more quality decisions in the moment and if you're just still kind of guessing and don't have that kind of plan of attack or you don't have this checklist you probably still might make the wrong decision because you don't know necessarily what you're trying to evaluate so i i again would echo coming up where your vulnerabilities are and then when you feel this way you go and check that i've been exposed to five out of the eight Mm-hmm. I probably should just go ahead and miss this workout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if it, I, I think the easiest, uh, the easiest question is like, oh, well, are you feeling sick? Just miss the workout. It's okay. Do you not feel up to a hundred percent? You know, it's like, and then you get kind of the balance between, you know, are you, are you just tired from training or are you, you know, feeling a little bit more stress? And that's where, that's where having a coach is valuable, right? Cause you run it by your coach and your coach will ask you more of those questions. And then if you respect your coach, which you should, then you should be able to say, okay, using the information that I talked to them about and the information that I'm, you know, in taking, I'm going to make the, uh, you know, make a, make a more informed decision. Um, and I must say, I, I will say that Aaron and I aren't, uh, you know, medical doctors. So, you know, always like if you are feeling sick, go to the doctor, you know, get tests, do other things like that. But just from a recommendation standpoint, I think it's always better to err on the side of caution, maybe miss one workout, then, you know, potentially extend that into missing five workouts to a week. I wanted to jump into your comment that we're not doctors, but say that while you were at the exchange, you did stay at a Holiday Inn Express, but... I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I did I did read three blog posts on how to, you know, how to get better from being sick, so I know exactly what to talk about. <laughs> um, no, uh, all, all joking aside, though. So, okay, so so now, though, we've, we've kind of transitioned into, yeah, you, you got sick. Not a, it's, you know, not 100% avoidable. Everyone gets sick. So then what's the protocol? Because, you know, it's like, I think HRV is probably, you know, the one of the best indicators of, you know, is your body reestablishing, you know, kind of that balance and everything like that. But I used to hear, you know, oh, for every day that you're sick, you know, you need to take uh, two days of, of easy work to ease back into it. And that would be saying, oh, this is like without using HRV. So how how do you have an athlete you know say come back from a sickness like if they if they're if they're sick for a week what's like your kind of you know standard protocol to get them back into into training so here one i like to see just normal resting heart rate come back to normal measures hopefully they've been doing that This is, again, me taking heart rate variability with all my athletes Mm -hmm. provides me with what that data is. But if, again, 
we, we should also probably say if you aren't doing this and you get sick and you try to start taking HRV, it's too late. You're not going to get quality yeah. information. You're not going to know what that baseline is. So this is the fact where that is completely non-existent. It's going to be super, super easy work. And what I want to do is see in that early stage is how the heart rate responds to the stress that we are providing now. Mm -hmm. Often when an athlete's going to get back into activity, we're going to see elevated heart rate to or numbers. Again, that's just telling us, okay, well, the body is still, the sympathetic nervous system is still being stressed higher than we want it to be. So mm -hmm. we don't want to add additional stress until we start to see that start to layer back to where it normally is. So if I'm seeing somebody that's holding a zone one activity at their zone two heart rate, one, I'm not going to push them past that point. Okay, we can probably flirt with zone two heart rate, but we don't want to flirt with zone two power or pacing in that strategy mm -hmm. because it's stimulating a zone two at zone one output. So if we go up to output of zone two, that's most likely going to take them into zone three and maybe even push them into zone four, depending on how bad the system is. And if we start flirting with that, then we're going to ride that roller coaster that we've talked about a couple of times. So mm -hmm. I want to see things kind of level out at that very, very easy zone one output effort. Start to see the heart rate where it might come back at zone two, start to come back to zone two and level out where the output should be equal to the heart rate. Once we start to see that, then we're going to start to push that athlete into a zone two. And again, I want to see the heart rate stay in zone two. If we have a couple of workouts where we see that consistency, all right, let's start to get back to normal training just because that is letting me know that your power output and your heart rate to your um, historical data is falling mm -hmm. within the same line. And I don't want to go. And I think that this is also where individuals that have gone through COVID have made some, some bad mistakes is that they've just gone hard. Didn't recognize, Oh, my heart rates in zone three, even though I'm doing a zone one effort here, mm -hmm. Well, why not? Uh, I missed some time. I need to go do these threshold bouts or I need to go do these VO2 max. Whoa, that's where you start throwing things off. So mm -hmm. I just want to see the historical data match the current data. And then when I start mm -hmm. to see that, that's where I know. And, and of course, Phil, it takes to, I mean, you got to have historical data to do this. Right, right. So if you're looking at an athlete that's just come to you or you don't have any information, again, as we talked about earlier, you're going to be better off taking care of that athlete in a very conservative approach. Maybe staying in that conservative V is like C1 effort for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. We maybe two longer than what you think before exposing them, you're going to be doing that athlete a heck of a lot more of a benefit than mm -hmm. saying, well, I don't have any of this data anyways. You, you're telling me you're feeling good. Let's go balls to the wall. Mm, not the best route. Right. And I mean, um, you know, if we, if we think about, right, it's still a, it's still a stress management um, procedure here at this point, right? You, your body is recovering. And, you know, if you do have historical data, that's great. But you have to remember that the amount of stress is exponentially proportional to how hard you're going in terms of exercise. So zone one and zone two, right, you know, that that amount of stress that you're accumulating is is fairly low. And that's why we can generally get more volume, right, associated with those zones. But as soon as you get up zone four, zone five, like, just when you were saying that, I was like, that actually would probably be one of the single worst things you could do is like, you're starting to feel better. And then you do like a really hard, you know, like VO2 max workout, or a threshold workout or something along those lines, because the amount of stress that you're going to accumulate, just in, you know, like, say, like 30 minutes of work, if you're doing like VO2 max workout is so much higher than if you just did your zone one zone two. And <laughs> you really have to get an idea of what, of how the body is actually responding 
to the stress that is exercise when you're coming back before then piling on more stress. And, you know, there's, there, there's things out there, right? That's like, oh, well, exercise is good for the immune system and other things like that. Yes, only when you're training and recovering appropriately, not when you're getting back from being sick. It is not good for the immune system when you're getting back from being sick because you're just going to stress that immune system more. So, as I said it's, earlier, it's, when the micro when the microchip is compromised, don't go throwing water on the microchip. <laughs> no, exactly, and you know so. And that's the same thing that that would be the same thing. Like if you're if you're thinking about, you know, like implementing like heat training or cold training or like other things like that. Yes, those are good for things like recovery and stimulating the physiology. But if if you go and do that, you know, when you're sick in your body, like that balance point between being sick and not sick is so close, you're riding that, you know, razor's edge you can easily push yourself back over it, you know, and it's, it's not then going to be beneficial. It's going to be very detrimental to you because you're just gonna, you know, you're, you're essentially a rat on a wheel at that point, just chasing recovery. And that's not going to work. Well, and recognize when you also most likely are going through winter in the northern hemisphere there's no racing going on when you're going through it in the southern hemisphere there's not a whole lot of racing going on parts of australia might have that luxury but you're not you're going to be better off even if it's race season or not race season to follow these same strategies but again don't start looking at oh i have a race in april and it's february and i'm sick i gotta start making up time it's not going to change you still want to get back to health and trust us when we say, if you go about this the right way, you're going to miss a lot less time. You're going to decrease a heck of a lot less fitness and you're going to be back on the horse a heck of a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're trying to mitigate the amount of time that you're actually spending doing that recovery from getting sick and being sick and, you know, again, I think, you know, most people who probably listen to this podcast, if, you, if you're not tracking right now, like say heart rate and power over time at, you know, at different intensities and all of that, I think the, 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 the easiest sort of thing that you can do so you can look back and see is track your heart rate and track your power output or your speed on your runs in your, in your bikes. Um, if you, if you want to start to get a little bit more into like the technological side of things. HRV is another great number to get. That's an outside marker of how, how stressed you really are. And like you said, it's not the, it's not the magic bullet, you know, to like for cures and other things like that, but it certainly gives you more context for what's actually happening. And you, you know, you say this all the time, right? It's a, uh, it's context and then content. So you have to understand how your body is responding to anything, you know, any stress, whether it's, you know, work, life, sick, sickness, um, exercise, other things like that. And then what you can do is you can put the content on top of it. So, so yeah, I think I really like, I really like your approach and, and that I think should open up some people's eyes to it is, you know, when you're, when you're first coming back to it, like a, just forget about, who you were as an athlete before coming back to things other than the historical markers of like, where is normally my zone two, where is my normal zone three and other things like that. Cause you're trying to then stay below those because you're not trying to accumulate too much physiological stress. Um, and then until the athlete really shows that they can handle the, the easy load stress, don't bump them up and do the hard workouts because that again is like one of the worst things you could possibly do for them. And saying this in bold capital letters, don't let your first workout be a hard effort because you need mm -hmm. to measure yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to have an easy workout and check your systems. How am I feeling? Mm -hmm. Does this hurt? How's the RPE? Man, 
I'm pedaling at 40% of my FTP and it's at a eight uh, ratings of perceived exertion. <laughs> right. Well, let me tell you, let's not be, all right, well, I'm going to finish this one off with some 30 seconds and 15 seconds. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, it'd be like you take your car, you know, to the, to the mechanic to get like your transmission fixed or something like that. And the first thing you do is you just floor it going down the highway or pulling out of the, the parking lot. It's like, no, that is terrible. You're not checking any of your systems. You're not seeing how the acceleration is. You're not, you know, double checking like the engine temp and the oil and other things like that. And, you know, so, so just like you would with, with really anything else, right. You need to do a little like systems check, right. It's <clears throat> yes. And like you said, forget about who you like. Okay, last week I got sick. Today's first day, real back on the calendar. I got these VO2 max efforts. No, no, capital nope. letters, bold. No, <laughs> yeah. don't do it. Don't mess with it because that is not the time to test it out. Mm -hmm. You wanna, you wanna. Let, let's let's crawl before we walk. In that case, yeah. It's, it's kind of the, it's the same mentality you should have too, if you have an injury that you're coming back from as well. Like, for example, I messed up my back a little while ago, which required me to do kind of a lot of lower intensity stuff. And, you know, if, if I decided to come back and just be like, okay, well, you know, last two or two Tuesdays ago, I did like, you know, a VO2 max workout where my 30 second intervals were four four oh five. I am just setting myself up for risk of higher risk of injury and higher risk of, uh, you know, making things worse by just jumping right back into it. Because most likely, you know, your, your body adapts to the stresses that it's put, put upon itself for the most part. But if you're sick, you're going to have, you know, you, you have to recover from that. So that physiological stress is going to be much higher at the same mechanical output 405 than it was back when I was like, you know, consistently hitting those workouts over and over. So again, you have to make the systems check. You have to do things that are going to slowly ramp up that system, stress the system here and there, make sure how make sure you understand how your body's responding before immediately just jumping in and being like, well, two weeks ago, I was able to run a marathon. So now I should be able to run a half marathon instead, <laughs> right? You mean you didn't jump in and do that workout that I screenshot to you yesterday? <laughs> as much as as much as I want to show you that I could keep up, I no, absolutely not. That would be again, that would that would be silly, right? That would it's one of those things where that would be my ego taking over and basically being like, um, yep, your your back is still hurt a little bit, but because you care what Aaron thinks and how you compare to Aaron's workouts, even though he's been healthy this whole time, you know, you're trying to uh, you know, essentially show that you can keep up, even though that's, again, that's inappropriate, right? <laughs> well, now that's to let everybody know, that's why I sent Phil that screenshot is because I know we're not competing against each other and he wasn't going to be an idiot. I know yes. what his workouts have <laughs> been lately. And it was just like, Hey, just wanted to show you, maybe think about this for your future. Yeah, no, no, no. It was a, it was a cool workout. And I think, um, I, I was thinking about this. I think one of the topics we need to cover is, you know, how do you make that transition from VO2 max to threshold style workouts and stuff like that? Because I think that's maybe a little bit where you're where you're headed. Um, but that's a, that's a little off topic. I think, though, I, I mean, you know, for, for the most part, I think we touched on everything I wanted to touch on today in terms of, you know, trying to avoid getting sick, what happens when you do get sick and how to how to come out of that. Is there is there anything you want to add before I, you know, kind of let everybody go? Um, this sometimes is easier removing yourself from the decision making process and whether you have a coach, significant other, close friend, a training partner, sometimes, sometimes this is the, one of those times that I would recommend having a conversation with those individuals, if you trust them, to give you a sense of 
intel, like just being removed from the scenario. Well, you know, maybe that's sometimes when we're in the in the decision, we don't make the best decisions. If we put it on somebody else, they're going to look at it with a little bit more intelligence. They're going to look at it with a little bit more perspective and they're going to give you honest feedback. So sometimes this would be that time where I would pay attention to what somebody else might have to say. I think the coach is a no brainer, but if you don't have a coach utilizing your network around you to help you make the right decision, because we're always going to talk ourselves into something. Ah, you're, 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 you're being you're weak. You're not doing this. Yeah. You're not. No, it's not about that. It's not a measuring stick of how, how your guts are put together. It's making a smart decision to allow yourself to get back to what you enjoy doing and ultimately get closer to where you're doing the what you're doing this for if you can get back to it quicker you're going to get closer to that point so mm -hmm. if if you're kind of at that especially if you're in that paralysis by analysis state ask somebody else's point of view and don't be afraid to listen to it and follow it so mm -hmm. i i just think Sometimes removing yourself from the scenario or the decision could be a very, very good call to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I think, you know, myself being uh, a self-coached athlete for a really long time, I always under, I always overestimate what I can do or what I'm capable of. And I think that re results in me um, getting injured a little bit too often, getting sick sometimes, other things like that. Whereas if you have somebody who is truly objective about the inputs and everything that's that's coming in then you're going to make a more informed decision you know whether it's you know coming back from sickness coming back from injury you know those sort of things um so with that we'll we'll leave you guys there if you have any questions uh for aaron or i you can always reach out to me instagram critical02 aaron's at try a geyser um, you, you can find him as always on Saturday mornings doing his, um, ride on his long ride on Zwift. So go ahead, jump on there. You can ask him questions and all of that. And, um, if you guys have any, you know, comments, leave them down below if you're on YouTube, or if you have any feedback for us, you can also, uh, respond within Spotify to, uh, tell us, you know, what, what you would like to see us do, um, you know, what questions, what topics you want us to, to visit. So. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode and we'll catch you guys in the next one.